The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Hey, welcome back for another episode of the Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show. I'm your host, Ira Wolf, and I'm w- I'm with well, actually, not I'm not with my co-host today, Co- Keith Compagna. We're working remote, uh, so that'll be uh, fun. Uh, m- Keith's working with his new mic and headset, so we're uh, <laughs> we're, we're going to give it. The evolution that. has begun. The evolution yeah. has begun. Um, we want to thank our sponsors, Jobvite and Success Performance Solutions, and we got a great guest today. You know that scientist in the action movie who has all the right answers if only the government would just pay attention? That's our guest. He's Eric Meyer and an employment law attorney at Fisher Broyles LLP. Uh, we'll be getting to Eric in just a minute. We got a whole boatload of uh, questions we want to talk about. Um, but before we get to Eric, uh, just a reminder to everyone streaming our show, we're live and our lines are open. So today would be a great day to call us, uh, ask Keith or me or Eric some questions, 561-623-9429. That's 561-623-9429. Love to have your questions, hear how we're doing. Uh, and, uh, I've got some big news on that account, um, Keith and and Eric and everyone else uh, listening, uh, you probably already know our shows. Our show is live. It's on W four C Y every Wednesday at one p.m. Uh, that's where we are right now. Uh, it's rebroadcast on iHeartRadio, but soon, and you didn't even know this, Keith. Uh, mm-hmm. Within a few weeks, the Geek Skeezers and Googleization show will be available on over three dozen outlets. Uh, we're going to be on Spotify, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud. Amazon, Alexa, uh, Google Play Music, uh, Roku, um, and about 25 other places. So uh, we'll, we'll keep you posted. Uh, so there shouldn't be any more excuses why you can't listen to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization show. So I've got a question for you, Keith. Um, can you believe this is our 11th show? <laughs> I can. It's 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 fascinating if thinking about how much has gone on in eleven weeks. Yeah, we've, but, uh, we've yeah we've covered a lot of topics. Uh, I don't want to slight any guests because everyone's been gracious gracious enough to spend some time with us, almost an hour. Uh, they, and it's funny, a lot of them say, "Hey, can we do one or two segments?" And um, they they can't believe how fast it goes. And I'm sure Eric will find the same thing today. Yeah. Um, but everyone has shared some great tips and insights. But are there any moments or messages that stood out from you over the last kind of ten weeks? Eleven. So this is our eleven. So ten weeks. So yeah. No. Uh, great question. Um, I, I I was really impressed with talking with Eric over at the Entrepreneur Magazine. Um, uh, in terms of not Eric. Um, what was his name? Daniel. What was the guy over at Entrepreneur Magazine talking about how over time older generations have always had a problem with younger generations? Yeah, uh, yeah, I got I, you, got, you got me thinking on the wrong direction right now. <laughs> yeah, um, yep. I'll, I'll, I'll catch his name in a second. So. Yep. Uh, Radcliffe, I think, or something like that. Um, I should know that, but uh, but it's been eleven weeks. Uh, I I think that the 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 difference of uh, of topic has been real playing out nicely Jason. as we look. It was, it was Jason. I knew as soon as you'd start talking, Jason Pfeiffer. Jason Pfeiffer, yes. Uh, I, I like Ira how the different topics have been really shaping and coloring in what's known as the future of work. There is no one topic that really is too far away from from engaging another topic and i know eric's going to have a lot to to add to that in terms of all the different nuances with regards to uh what he's been doing helping out organizations stay in stay uh ahead of the curve or at least keep up with all these changes Uh, what about you any any guest 
stick out more than any other or any you know, topics? I've enjoyed them all. Um, I, I think last week's, um, you know, it was great. Um, I wasn't sure where that was going to go. You know, we talked about uh, uh, being well 365 with uh, Dave Quinn. Um, that, that was really good. I know that resonated with you. Um, I think uh, with Dr. Pimentel a few mm-hmm. weeks ago, um, you know, a lot more coming out with that. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've, we've covered everything from me Too movement to future of work and AI and, uh, today's theme will, will just continue, you know, on that. Um, I'm working on a couple things. I'm actually working on a, a new article. Um, hopefully it'll be published. Uh, it'll be out there by the beginning of January on Cornerstone. Um, but it was a lot of things in, that Google's been doing. You know, that, um, you know, we, we've talked about Google for jobs for a while, um, that's certainly having a big in- impact. Uh, but other things that, that fly under the radar are most people, um, you know, with about page speed, uh, mobile first updates by Google that's disrupting how the jobs are. Well, one is if your jobs aren't showing up in Google for jobs, that's a problem. And then uh, even if they are showing up, they're not getting ranked high because of a lot of things that recruiters uh, and HR never considered. I mean, why, why would they ever worry about a Google update, an algorithm update, <laughs> you know, before uh, and then voice searches coming down the pike. So uh, stay tuned. We should I'm um, actually working on a few guests for January and February uh, that can talk about some of that stuff. Well, uh, but I'll uh, oh, go ahead. I tell you what, there's something to be said about how technology is really disrupting the way HR approaches talent acquisition. Um, Something I forgot to mention earlier, which, you know, goes to show once you start asking me to think about the last three months or so, I I can't think about what happened yesterday. But um, I was recently put into the Wall Street Journal. Uh, there was an article that Chip Cutter had put out there talking about how some large organizations are using automated voice interview systems. And he pr- you know, presented the question out to LinkedIn in terms of what everyone thought. And he thought my response, uh, which had everything to do with the notion that recruiting is inherently about people and that the more technology that you use the wrong way, the more difficult your talent acquisition team is going to actually be able to establish relationship with potential candidates so uh something that's probably worth mentioning check me out check it out on linkedin but i got some wall street journal press this yeah, last that's, week. that's very cool hey I, you told me about that last week i forgot to follow up yeah. congratulations that's great hey and and just one thing and this will be the kind of the lead into eric um you know we and, and again these are terms and phrases that most people aren't familiar with but you know we, we talk about the web uh, we're talking, you know, we, we live and die on that these days. Um, but the, the web has gone through a few iterations. Um, you know, we had uh, web, what they call 1.0. It was, uh, that's where, you know, we posted documents. We had static web pages. Uh, there wasn't a lot of interaction. And then web 2.0, which is what we have now, uh, came out and we had multimedia content, social media came into being participatory social media. It wasn't one way. It wasn't like a listserv or, or just emails. They, they were active. They were live. They were streaming. Um, you know what, what's coming down um, and they're talking about maybe toward the end of next year, 2019, but definitely by 2020. Um, we're talking about having fi- the convergence of 5G, you know, mm. the faster connectivity, artificial intelligence, VR and AR, virtual reality and augmented reality, and over a trillion sensors being out there. And we've talked about autonomous vehicles and, you know, we haven't gotten into wearable clothing. Uh, That may be something Eric can comment when we get there. Um, But this is going to dramatically impact HR. I mean, it's it's already changing how professional training is done. It's delocalizing businesses. It's, it's, you know, we we consider uh, virtual, working virtual uh, in today's space, um, uh, you know, I mean, like you are, I mean, you're working virtually, you're working from home. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm working from home. Um, Eric told us he's there, he's working from home. Um, you know, that, that's one thing, but what happens when we have this spatial web point web 3.0 or spatial web, uh, and it completely transforms, uh, how, how something's, you know, ha- how, how we participate, how we interact with everyone. Uh, and and so with that, I, I do want I want to bring Eric on. Um, I, I've mentioned him a couple times, but uh, Eric Meyer, 
Um, he helps get companies HR compliant before the action sequence. Uh, I mentioned before, he was that that scientist who warns the world of what's going to happen and nobody tends to listen. Uh, he's a partner in the employment group at Fisher Broyles LLP. Uh, interesting, Fisher, which I didn't realize until I read his bio, Fisher Broyles is the first and world's largest cloud-based law firm partnership. They got over 220 attorneys, 21 offices nationwide. Uh, Eric's a volunteer EEOC mediator, a paid pri um, private mediator, and a publisher of the handbook, uh, which you can get at www.theemployerhandbook.com, uh, which he tells me is pretty much the best employment law blog ever. <laughs> so, so, Eric, welcome to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Ira and Keith. It's great to be here. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, we talked about some of these changes and, and I'm sure that, um, you know, I mean, just to mad, I, I guess what what's employment law going to look like uh, with virtual reality and artificial reality? But let's start with something simpler that, that people can relate to. Um, I've been using social media for a long time. Uh, Keith, I'm not sure when you got into it. I think I probably am a little bit more active than you are. but, uh, but uh, And I've got 20 years on you, too. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, I, linked, I, I looked this up this, when I was preparing for this. Um, I The first uh, network I joined was uh, LinkedIn, March 6, 2006. So I've been on it for 13, almost 13 years. I'm a big, big advocate. I try to be realistic in how it's used. Uh, it still surprises me. You know, it probably shocks me how many professionals don't still don't participate. You know, I got to look at the look up their profile on LinkedIn, and they don't have one. Um, but because I was an early adopter, I ended up doing a lot of speaking between like 2008, 20, maybe 2013. Uh, lawyers pretty much warned everybody to avoid social media, and uh, or at least be very careful. But now we're you know we're, we're approaching 2019. Facebook is over 2.27 billion users. LinkedIn's got up 500 million users. Snapchat has 186 million users every day. Uh, social media is mainstream. Um, what's, what have you seen, Eric, that's changed over the last few years? And the bigger question is, how should employers be using social media? Um, well, a couple things I've seen change. Uh, first of all, lawyers are, well, what hasn't changed is lawyers are bad business people. Um, it's something in their DNA. So when you ask a lawyer to combine his or her legal advice with some kind of platform, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, that can be used for business development, um, salespeople use it to augment their network, you name it. Um, those two forces don't necessarily mesh well. So the lawyer's initial instinct is, and, and yeah, I was going to say not to stereotype it, but to stereotype it, usually it's the lawyers <laughs> with the white ha with the white hair say, oh, you know, don't do that. There, there's problems, liability, things like that. Stay away. Um, but but you have to approach it from a pretty pragmatic standpoint that businesses get you know a huge economic advantage, um, business advantage from using these platforms and from having their employees use these platforms responsibly. So it's more educating employees still as to how to use these platforms responsibly. Um, uh, as, as, as simple as reminding someone who has a Facebook page to, hey, if you don't want to share everything that you're posting with the world, just adjust your privacy settings, right? Um, we could save a lot of trouble and heartache by doing that. Um, employers don't end up above the fold for the wrong reasons um, when employees set their Facebook pages to private and they say stupid discriminatory stuff. Um, so it's, it's a lot about education um, and it's about accepting that you know, <laughs> companies are going to use this, employers are going to use this one way or another. So let's, let's guide them and help them do it in a way that's not going to cause issues, legal issues for the company. So, so what are some of the, the, you know, I, again, so company says, okay, we agree. We've got to use social media. Um, and, and our focus, Keith and I, my focus is, is primarily on, you know, talent acquisition and, ta and retention. Um, so what are some of the first steps that, um, that you suggest for uh, that you recommend 
to to an employer? Where where do they get started to do this right? Sure. So so the biggest issue that that could arise is is discrimination, um, whether overt or or implicit, and you know, that could be as simple as you go onto someone's LinkedIn page and you see their LinkedIn photo. And maybe they're wearing a hijab or they're wearing a Star of David or they are African-American or they just don't fit the stereotype that we're looking for, either, again, explicitly or implicitly. Um, So if we're going to use social media as part of the recruiting process, the decision maker, the ultimate decision maker and who's going to get the job should have as much what I'll call you know, as a lawyer, protected class information stripped away so that what ultimately is placed on his or her desk is um, a set of credentials that either match up with um, what they're looking for, exceed in a good way what you're looking for, or don't don't get to that 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 high water level. So um, you're making a decision purely based on the business needs of the company, and you're not taking into account any sort of that, uh, again, protected class information, where if you were to deny someone a job because of their the color of their skin or who they pray to or how old they are, um, that's what gets you into trouble. So, you know, I mean, you know, we went through the whole period where in an application, you didn't, uh, you know, you certainly def- submitting a photograph is gone. You know, that's probably twenty thir- or thirty years ago uh, that 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 stopped. Um, but now we've got candidates submitting uh, videos, you know, or doing video interviews. Um, you know, how does that? You know, what I guess how does a how does a, a um, an employer? Um, protect themselves when candidates, especially the the top talent, is submitting video uh, resumes, uh, video interviews to uh, to to get attention. Sure. Well, yeah. Obviously, there, there's not going to be any perfect way to avoid seeing or hearing someone. And I'm not suggesting that for, from a talent acquisition standpoint that it would make any sort of sense to um, not talk to someone face to face or via video, Skype whatever whatever way you want to go about hiring that works best for your business, God bless you, go for it. Um, but a way to avoid issues, legal issues with hiring then is to have a standardized set of hiring criteria that your hiring managers, that your whoever's in talent acquisition is going to apply evenly across the board. So that way you're not going to have these ad hoc employment decisions that, you know, if someone's, if a company's press as to why you hired John but not Jill, you can just go back to this set of this set of hiring criteria, and you can say John checked every box, but Jill didn't, and we apply this set of hiring criteria to everyone we're looking for in this particular position. Yeah. Hey, thanks. And you're listening, just a reminder to everybody, you're listening to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization show. Uh, we have our guest today, Eric Meyer from Fisher Broyles LLP, talking about uh, employment law. Uh, we started with social media. We're going to be talking a little bit about the impact uh, on uh, with artificial intelligence uh, and also uh, some other changes that are some other employment law uh, changes that are coming down the pike. Uh, you can call us at 561-623-9429. Uh, we'd love to have your questions. Uh, we're going to be taking a very short break here. Uh, we'll be back in about two minutes. You'll hear from our sponsors, Jobvite and Success Performance Solutions. But stay, stay right where you are. We'll be right back in two minutes. Have you ever dreamt of being on the radio? Well, now is your chance. Be a radio show guest on the number one ranked internet radio station and promote you and your business for free. Yes, you heard it, free. Business advertising right here on W4CY.com. Call 561-506-4031 now to get booked on one of our shows. That's 561-506-4031. Get your free advertising now. What's up, everyone? This is Keith from the Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show, powered by Jobvite. Jobvite knows career paths are made by people, not by open job requisitions. Jobvite's platform ties recruitment marketing directly to applicant tracking and onboarding, creating continuous candidate engagement 
that effectively connects recruiters with qualified passive candidates. Used by over 50,000 recruiters placing over 1 million jobs, Jobvite's platform impacts every company in every industry. Check us out at jobvite.com. Listen carefully. Up to 9 out of 10 job candidates visiting your company career page leave before completing an application. You heard that right. 90% of candidates who want to apply for a job at your company don't. That's just plain crazy, especially in today's tight labor market. Candidate experience matters. Stop turning candidates away. Let Success Performance Solutions help. Call us at 800-803-4303 or register at successperformancesolutions.com slash W4CY. Schedule a no-obligation consultation and get special access to insider tips to recruit faster and hire smarter. Welcome back to the Geek Skeezers and Googlers. Googleization show. I still can't get that out. Uh, I'm your host, Ira Wolf, with my co-host, Keith Compagna, and our special guest today is Eric Meyer from Fisher, Fisher Broils, LLP. Uh, when we left off, we were talking about uh, social media and the law and HR. Um, Eric, um, it, a lot of, not all states, but a lot of states are, you know, under at-will employment. And I've heard you speak about this at a couple conferences. I, I forgot to mention that during uh, during your intro, by the way, is, is uh, you know, I, I've probably heard you a dozen times over the last few years. And you're always you're, it, it's tough to make employment law presentations entertaining, but somehow you do it. Uh, so but uh, social media and, and how what's its impact on at will employment? Well, I, I do a fair number of, of trainings, as you mentioned, Ira, and this year it's been slanted towards Me Too and employers getting on the ball. Um, but what I try and mix in when I do, I'll call them respect in the workplace trainings, is I do mix in a little bit about social media um, and with emphasis on the 24-7 world of social media. That is to say, when I punch out for the day and I go home and I go onto Facebook and I post something... I'm still responsible for, for what I say and do online. So while I have these rights, this First Amendment right to free speech, I don't have a First Amendment right to a job. And that brings it back to at-will employment. So if I do something online, whether it's during work hours or off work hours, that um, paints the company in a bad light, that is harassing, that is discriminatory, whether it's directed to a coworker or just you know, generally racist uh, communications. If I post a picture of my Halloween costume where I'm dressed up in blackface, you know, and my employer finds out about this, they can fire me, right? That is at will, right? I, I can be hired or I can be fired for any reason or no reason at all, as long as my termination is not discriminatory. And hiring me, uh, firing me, excuse me, because I'm a racist, um, is is not is completely consistent with with at will employment. So you, you've mentioned, I mean, within that, you've mentioned Me Too, and we, we had some guests a few weeks ago and talking about the impact of Me Too movement on, on HR, um, and they were talking more from, um, uh, you know, they, they had it from a um, kind of an HR consultant perspective. Um, with, you know, all the changes with artificial intelligence and, you know, and social media, um, you know, how should companies be responding to harassment complaints? I mean, you, you mentioned you'd been doing a lot of training this year on, on Me Too and for, for good reasons. Um, you know, what, I, I guess what are, what are the first steps companies need to do and, and what are some of the suggestions both from the employer side and the employee side? Well, from the employer side, it's it's really important to take these complaints of harassment seriously. Um, first off, you want to create, well, before we even get to that, um, you want to create a mechanism, whether it's an employee handbook, training, hopefully both, um, where employees know that here's what's tolerated in the workplace and here's what's not. And if something happens that's not tolerated, I can complain about it. And here are these various avenues 
um, that I can go down to complain, not just to my direct supervisor, because my supervisor may be the harasser, but to another supervisor, to HR, to the CEO, to an ombudsman, to a chat bot, to uh, a, a, an anonymous tip line, whatever it is, that there are these avenues. But then, then once that complaint comes in, the company needs to take that very seriously. Managers especially need to be trained to take that seriously. They don't have to resolve the issue on the spot, but they just have to make sure that someone who's in a position to look into it, to take steps that are reasonably designed to end the complaint of harassment, make sure those steps happen. So I, so I've got two questions. I mean, you know, one is uh, certainly being a lot more sensitive to employees, to workers, um, giving them more avenues. And, and I have a follow up question to that uh, with that regard. Um, but, you know, I guess where is the line being if there, and, and there is no line, but where where is the, the range being drawn between people being easily insulted I guess, versus harassment. I mean, and, and I know there's no clear answer, but I know a lot of employers I hear is, is uh, you know, and you hear this on the news and the comedians, I mean, it is politically correctness, you know, has the pendulum swung so far that everyone is overly sensitized. And, you know, just because I don't feel, um, you know, if, if I'm looked at wrongly, then that gives me the right to file a claim. Um, because you can you can see where companies can be overwhelmed. So I mean, I guess how do you advise people to have a a balance? Uh, you know, how how do employers know when it's legit and not legit, and and what should they do? Well, I, I think they have to look into each claim. Um, it's something that is as I'll call it relatively straightforward and simple as this person looked at me the wrong way, or this person called me honey or dear instead of my first name. Um, those can be addressed without a full-blown investigation and a simple counseling if that's what happened. Um, if someone has a particularly thin skin, um, then there are ways to counsel that person, not to chill them from complaining going forward, but to remind them that that type of behavior, although you know maybe, maybe not the most pleasant in the world, doesn't necessarily uh, constitute discrimination um, under our, our, our policies and procedures. Um, but my concern is the folks who, um, in our political climate right now, and this is not to fault anyone in particular, it's pretty vicious on both sides, who come to work thinking that we don't have to be politically correct anymore. Because when that happens, there's a slippery slope to discrimination. And let me give you just a very recent example. Um, on Halloween, you had a number of elementary school teachers in Idaho dress up as the wall. Um, and it just said, make America great again. And they were the wall. And then they changed costumes and they put on this very, stereo this very stereotypical Mexican garb with mustaches and sombreros and all sorts of Mexican, you know, it, you know, stereotypically Mexican um, uh, uh, attire, and you know, they're coming to school dressed like this, right? And I think their position is, well, you know, we don't have to be politically correct. Uh, whatever, whatever was in their head um, <laughs> was was not intelligence, right? It was, um, it was, it was, it was, it was right. poor. Not very well thought out. And, and the ramifications, even if they think to themselves, well, you know, why do we have to be politically correct anymore? And can't people just take a joke? Well, you know, some of their students are going to be Hisp are Hispanic, right? So think about their, their parents, right? Do they want to be taught by teachers who have this in them to come to school dressed this way? Um, probably not. So there are real issues that come from people who think that you don't have to be so politically correct anymore. You know, it, it actually, and my, the mind with that, and, and again, it's just trying to put this into perspective. And I, I've got a couple decades of, of living through things that I, you know, that, that now seem unbelievable, uh, especially the, the 60, you know, in the sixties and, and even, uh, the late fifties. Um, but over the weekend I, I saw two interesting movies. I saw Schindler's list again, it's 25 years since it was out. Uh, my wife had never seen it. So we, we went to see it and that's certainly uh, something that, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, 25 years ago, there's a lot of people that, that weren't even alive when the movie came out yet, yet alone that, 
Um, but then we saw the green room, which, you know, took us back into the 50s uh, or the 60s and early 70s. And, you know, suddenly the racial divide and and being in the South and some of the discrimination. And and to consider that was at least in my lifetime uh, that that still existed, um, you know. But then, you you know, today we're talking about, um, you know, many of the things that were normal um, back uh, then, uh, you know, the incident with the wall. Um, it, you know, as you said, with Halloween would have been nothing. Uh, it wouldn't even have been, in, in fact, the people who criticized it probably would have been the people that were condemned, um, you know, back in the sixties and seventies. Um, you know, it's still shocking that it, that it still happens in so many parts of the countries, but you're absolutely right about the, the, um, you know, there, there's certainly a brash attitude, a pretty bold attitude that now almost anything, anything goes. You know, and that that people are just overly sensitive uh, by that. So um, a lot of work to be done. It's it's obviously a very, very fine line. Um, Hey, we're going to take another quick break here. But when we come back, uh, we're going to be talking a little. We'll finish up on how AI, artificial intelligence, um, Me Too movement, social media is impacting uh, in, in employers, not not just their, not necessarily for re- recruitment, but also for retention. Um, but we're also going to. I know this is only a big area for you, Eric. We're going to look at what's ahead in 2019. Do a quick recap on on employment law changes of 2018 and look at 2019. Uh, You've been listening to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization show. Uh, We're going to hear very shortly from our sponsors, Jobvite and Success Performance Solutions. Uh, We have our guest today, Eric Meyer from Fisher Broyles LLP. Uh, As I said, we're talking about social media, AI, Me Too movement, uh, employment law, uh, how that's affecting hiring and uh, the workplace. So stay right, stay right where you are. We'll be back in just about two minutes. Have you ever dreamt of being on the radio? Well, now is your chance. Be a radio show guest on the number one ranked internet radio station and promote you and your business for free. Yes, you heard it, free. Business advertising right here on W4CY.com. Call 561-506-4031 now to get booked on one of our shows. That's 561-506-4031. Get your free advertising now. What's up, everyone? This is Keith from the Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show, powered by Jobvite. Jobvite knows career paths are made by people, not by open job requisitions. Jobvite's platform ties recruitment marketing directly to applicant tracking and onboarding, creating continuous candidate engagement that effectively connects recruiters with qualified passive candidates. Used by over 50,000 recruiters placing over 1 million jobs, Jobvite's platform impacts every company in every industry. Check us out at jobvite.com. Listen carefully. Up to 9 out of 10 job candidates visiting your company career page leave before completing an application. You heard that right. 90% of candidates who want to apply for a job at your company don't. That's just plain crazy, especially in today's tight labor market. Candidate experience matters. Stop turning candidates away. Let Success Performance Solutions help. Call us at 800-803-4303 or register at successperformancesolutions.com slash W4CY. Schedule a no-obligation consultation and get special access to insider tips to recruit faster and hire smarter. Welcome back, everybody, to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show. Uh, Ira Wolf here with Keith Campagna and Eric Meyer talking about the state of employment law in certain capacities. And, and Eric, one of the things I wanted to circle back here with you was the idea that employers, you mentioned, and, and I jotted down, employers getting up. Uh, on the ball as it relates to some of these very dynamic and very rapidly changing elements we've been discussing today. How is it that you've seen effective HR leaders present a a fair and appropriate warning to C-levels 
because we both know that there's a whole lot of activity going on at a sea level and not everybody can pay attention to everything. What's worked with some of the clients that you've worked with or maybe just from your perspective in terms of helping HR get the message heard so that they can get the, the support from, from the C-suite? Sure. So I, I, you need to speak the language of the C-suite. So for example, when I send emails to CEOs, bullet points. <laughs> I do mm-hmm. not send long emails. They're bullet points. Um, when HR wants to get the C-suite's attention on harassment, um, you have to speak dollars and cents, right? So there's going to be a cost to the training. But with that training, how much money are you going to save on the back end with lawsuits, potential lawsuits, um, rise in insurance rates if you have insurance coverage for the number of claims that get put in? What is the cost of ending up, you know, I, I use this uh, metaphor, not metaphor, you know, ending up above the fold um, in, in, in the New York Times or you know, locally here, the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, what is the cost? Uh, not for a good reason, but, but because one of your employees is suing you for, for sexual harassment or discrimination. So it's, I subscribe to the theory that, you know, yes, we're supposed to change culture. This is the time to change culture. But companies like C-suite, unless there's a sale of the company, you know, people aren't going to change who they are, right? So I think in, in, in impacting and getting a culture change probably not going to happen so well. But there are things you can do, you know, instilling accountability, treating the person who cleans the C-suite the same way as the person who sits in the C-suite when there's a claim of discrimination, right? Zero tolerance. That doesn't mean you fire someone if there's a claim, a substantiated claim of discrimination, but that does mean that you take some action that is reasonably designed to end the harassment. If it's egregious enough, a touching, something like that, yeah, it's going to be a termination of employment. So it's, 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 talking about it though in, in dollars and cents and then actually following through and doing some of the stuff that is designed to reduce the number of claims. And Ira, that really falls in line with uh, a previous guest of ours, Rebecca and um, Nicolette from HR Uprise, when they were talking about the key element for HR leaders would be really to just establish that standard operating procedure in terms of all instances so that it could be not just a witch, it's not really a witch hunt, so to speak, but more so just here's what you do in the event of any of these, you know, uh, advancements and, and how the company is going to address it going forward and zero tolerance to a certain degree plays a role. Yeah, absolutely. So, and and with that, Technology, I mean, things are just going to keep changing. You know, the, the pace of change is, is happening faster. Technologies are disrupting. We're talking, you know, when we talked about social media, you know, I know, I know a lot of employers look at that uh, as a uh, disruptive force, uh, not for the good. Uh, it's not disruptive that creates good change, but bad change. But a lot of these technologies are are. Uh, improving things. I mean, they're, they're really making it better. They're exposing a lot of the, the faults and the vulnerabilities. So, Eric, I, I know you you have, um, you know, you've done a lot of work or have a lot of opinion on, you know, the, the role of artificial intelligence, how that's going to impact, uh, you know, business. Uh, you mentioned even before about chatbots and, you know, chatbots are technology. And usually I have people roll their eyes when they hear about a chatbot. Yet you even suggested that as a means that when people have a concern in the workplace, maybe about harassment, that they can go to a chatbot. A, a chatbot. So you know, what are what are some of the positive changes you're seeing with technology? Uh, and then you know, with that, uh, it's hard to talk about technology without some of the warning signs. So what I, what's big on your horizon? <laughs> well, some of the positive changes using AI for hiring. When done well, uh, obviously Amazon uh, is is the biggest example of a company that that inadvertently stepped in it, so to speak. Um, their artificial intelligence had the tendency to to uh, screen out women. So you know, you're, I, I suppose your artificial intelligence is only as good as the folks that are programming it, right? Absolutely. It ultimately comes back to a human who's who's helping to put the algorithms in. So um, if you're going to use artificial intelligence for hiring, and I think it's great because it is, you know, in the long run, it's going to be cost effective. It's going to be a lot faster. You're freeing up. Um, 
your talent acquisition teams to deploy them to go elsewhere. So, I mean, I think it, it really is efficient, but you just want to make sure that you're auditing the the hiring process, um, that you're talking to your vendors about what you're looking for, things like that. Um, and obviously making sure that that it, it's not inadvertently discriminating against one protected class. Um, so Eric, quickly, I, I have a question with that because this comes up all the time. And, you know, I mean, I make my living with employee assessments and, you know, people always want to know that, you know, are they biased? If if an algorithm, let, let's say the algorithm is put in there and it does discriminate against a, a protected class, but the but it can be, uh, I don't, I'm not sure what the right word is, but let's say validated that a you know white men over 40 were more productive. They actually were more profitable, more productive. They had lower turnover, uh, higher retention. Um, you know, if the artificial intelligence algorithm proves to be accurate. How does how does that play into the protected class? Or well, how's that defended, I, I guess, by a company? I, I, that's really tough to defend because it, the algorithm is specifically focusing on two protective classes, white and over 40, as hiring criteria. So for someone who is not white and, well, let yeah, usually people under forty don't have the age discrimination claim. So let's let's flip it around. Let's say that we're, we're under forty and white is the ideal candidate. Someone who doesn't check those boxes, who isn't hired, can say, "Hey, company, you took you know my protective class into account. That motivated your decision not to hire me, um, and, and that does bring about a a claim." Here's the thing, right? Technology is always going to outpace the law. <laughs> so, so you know, you, you can get up there and explain to a judge how great your technology is, but the law is, you know, going to be behind it. So yeah. if it there's, if it's if it smells like it walks slide. like a duck and talks like a duck, you know. Yeah, there, there's <laughs> a slide that I use, and I and I give credit. I mean, it's from Deloitte, um, and it's a great slide, but it shows the curve of, um, you know, where technology, individuals, business, and public policy exists. And public policy is about flatlined. And, uh, you know, technology and business is like a hook, <laughs> it, right. a straight hook going up. So I know it's tough to create that visual here, but no, you're absolutely right. Good point, Eric. <laughs> yeah, you're just seeing courts reference Me Too in judicial opinions. So, I mean, Me Too started, what? more than a year ago right. yeah, so yeah that's yeah about a year ago this time yeah, yeah absolutely yeah so so where do you see um so let's we, we just have a few minutes here yet um uh, you know there's a lot that's happened this year you, you mentioned me too movement showing up in in uh, the courts uh i guess a quick recap of the 2018 and what's um what do you see going on 2019 as, as far as employment law yeah, I mean, 2018 certainly was the year of Me Too and and training. Um, it was not the year of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, there was supposed to be a lot of stuff going along going on back in 2016 and 17. Changes to who would be eligible for overtime and things like that. And under the Trump administration, it just obviously it hasn't happened. Um, it, there ha hasn't been much, you know. Changed in 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 uh, disability discrimination and family medical leave. What we're going to see soon, I think, the next big thing we're going to see is uh, the Supreme Court taking up um, a sexual orientation discrimination case or maybe a transgender discrimination case. So we'll get guidance from the Supreme Court as to whether discrimination based on sexual orientation, I'll just say LGBT rights generally, violates federal anti-discrimination law. The courts are starting to split on that, and we need the federal court to decide. Of course, on state and local level, it's, it's a different story. But I think that's the next big thing that's coming up. And then looking a little further, maybe into 2019, I think we will start to see some changes with the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, the Department of Labor has suggested that they're going to adjust what's called the salary level. Um, the test that if you're paid a salary, if you're above a certain amount, you may not be eligible for overtime. But if you're under a certain amount, you would be eligible to receive that premium overtime pay. So the Department of Labor is talking about raising that level. It's not going to be, you know, we're right now we're at 23,000 and change. It's not going up to 70,000, right? But it may go into the mid 30s. Um, and that that could 
that can that play a role a in the workplace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can, for sure. Yep. Yeah. Sure can. Good. Well, thank Any, you very much, Eric. Yeah. Hey, we're oh, we're just you. about uh, rounding out the show here. Um, Eric, you know, I want to, first of all, I want to thank you. I mean, you're always a pleasure to listen to. And again, I, I always look forward to the, the times that I, we get those engagements. Um, it, what's the best way for people to uh, get in touch with you if you, if they have any questions or they want to reach out or they want you to do some training? Sure. Um, people can visit my blog, uh, the All my social media links are, are connected there and you can sign up for uh, daily uh, blog post updates. I post every weekday, so you'll get you'll get it that way. And um, if you go to my law firm's website, Fisher Broyles, that's F-I-S-H-E-R-B-R-O-Y-L-E-S.com, and you search around, you can find all my contact information there. But connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, uh, I'm very active in social media, and I, and I look forward to, to getting, uh, getting to know some of your listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Really absolutely. appreciate you uh, taking the time. I always enjoy talking to you. Uh, you have a good holidays and uh, happy new year. And hopefully we can have you back uh, next year and talk about the 2020 updates and what's going on. So I really appreciate it, Eric. Thanks. Thank you both Thanks. gentlemen. Yeah. yeah. Take care. Happy holidays. So Keith, we got a couple things to kind of wrap up here. Um, I, I, I don't know if you saw this. I just put it out uh, over the weekend. I finally finished my new ebook on Google My Business. Uh, that's one of those uh, lost opportunities that companies have. It's uh, most people, I, I don't, you know, I put up a poll and so far it's been 0% knew what Google Posts were. Do, mm-hmm. do you know what Google Posts are? Yeah, yeah, maybe for me you do. <laughs> so, uh, just yeah. a little bit, but I know yeah. that it's changing. Yeah, I mean, Google, Google Post is is part of the Google My Business. That's that little algorithm that, not the algorithm, that's that uh, image that shows up on your business on the right-hand side if you search for your business. It talks about your where your hours are, you know, where your, your location, a map, how to get there. You can put some photos up. But um, you can actually post your jobs there, and it's free. Um, and most companies don't know about it. So I created a free ebook. You can go up to my website uh, or just contact me on LinkedIn. Be happy to send you the link. Um, and uh, you know, I'll have to make sure you send it out to, you, to your group there, Keith, sure. you know, as well. Yeah, it's Google My Business. Um, you know, Google, my, Google for Jobs is still big. That's going to have some uh, bigger and bigger ramifications in 2019. Um, we announced the last few weeks, and it's still up there, the uh, 2018 uh, Job Fight Recruiting Benchmark Report. Uh, you'll probably yep. be getting a, one of the, a new one out in early in 2019. Um, yep. But just came out as the Recruiter Nation. Yes. Job like recruiting nation re- study. So uh, you want to make sure you you get a hold of that. Uh, we got a great guest next week. Um, again, speaking on the team, the future of work. Uh, Danny Inney, uh, I N Y is his last name. Um, he's a the uh, an author of several books, but uh, we're going to be talking about the future of education and the future of online courses. Uh, how companies are going to be working with that. So, yeah, so that'll be a, a great topic. And that'll that'll be actually our last show of the year because then we got we got Christmas and, and New Year's. So that'll be um, it'll, it'll be exciting. Uh, any closing words, thoughts? No, just uh, yes. wanted to let you know that we did. There was that uh, that life work integration webinar I had uh, scheduled at the beginning of December has been moved and uh, rescheduled to the end of January. More to come on that in 2019. Uh, but I think it's just fantastic. The the variety, you know, when we first started talking about this podcast, I we talked about how many different directions we could go. And I just love how the, it's it's turning out here with the, the, the different types of cl- um, guests that we have and, and the topics really are pretty, pretty current. And, and, and I like to think based on the feedback that I've been getting, certainly that uh, p- the audience is starting to get a, a lot of um uh, you know, familiarity with what it is that we're bringing here and, and the content is something that they could yeah. use going forward with their everyday job. So, And, and that will be on over 36 different outlets. That's fantastic by 2019, so, fantastic. so we'll really get the word out. So again, hey, um, Keith, um, always great to have you as, as my co-host here, as my side chair. You bring some great insights and opportunity. You've been listening to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization show where we bring you topics and thought leaders discussing of future of work where the tired the wired and technology converge until next Wednesday. 
and every Wednesday after that at 1 p.m. Eastern Time on W4CY.com, iHeartRadio, and a whole load of other podcasts soon in 2019. This is your host, Ira Wolf, co-host Keith Compagna. Don't let the shift hit your plans. Thank you.